You know who Philip of Macedonia was? Most people don't know Philip. They know his famous kid. Alexander the Great conquered most of the known world at the time. Philip of Macedonia was a pretty good dad. He hired Aristotle to tutor Alexander the Great. Think about that. If you were an econ major, it'd be like your mom or dad hiring Alan Greenspan to be your tutor, you know, and, which could explain why he became Alexander the Great and not Alexander the Dork. You know, I'm guessing that had something to do with it. But, but it was Philip of Macedonia. I read this quote once. I love the quote. It said, uh, Philip of Macedonia said, an army of deer led by a lion is more to be feared than an army of lions led by a deer. And you know why I loved it? Because it was so close to being right. But it wasn't. It was off just a little bit because with all due respects to good old Philip of Macedonia, an army of lions led by a lion is to be feared most of all. The only thing better than good leadership at the top is good leadership top to bottom, bottom to top where every member of the team or the congregation or the community knows when is it appropriate to lead and they know how to do it. Everything you do promotes or pollutes. There is no neutral. There is no middle ground. We're either promoting with our lives or polluting the lives of others because people are listening and watching. I got a brother-in-law that's a shrink, makes for interesting family reunions. Those of you that do counseling will know this adage, listen to words but believe behaviors. By the way, you don't have to teach people that. If they're healthy, they listen to what people say, but they watch what they do. If there's discrepancy, they choose the behavior over the words. Doesn't do any good to talk about how committed you are to customers if you make fun of them behind closed doors because they're hard to get along with. It's not what we say, it's what we do. And that's what self-mastery or self-responsibility is about, number one. That's the foundation. Until we're willing to take responsibility for doing the best we can with what we've got, we can't expect others to do so. Here's what I have learned. You don't get full credit in life unless you take full responsibility. Do you notice how people love to take credit but place blame? When things are successful, I did it. When things don't go right, somebody else caused it to go wrong. You only get full credit when you take full responsibility. That's number one. Number two, focus. You only got three resources. I'm an economist. Let me tell you something. Money's not a resource. Money's a byproduct. Money and funding are a byproduct of the only three resources you've got. Your time, your expertise, and the time and expertise of your team. Is it possible to over-recognize and over-appreciate people? Listen, what most of us in the room do for a living as promoters and pilots is called front stage rock and roll, but we couldn't do it without the people backstage. And I have found that the best performers are the ones that are most grateful for the people behind the curtain. But would you agree with me? The longer we live and work with another human being, the more we take them for granted. It's like a guy I know who's married for 50 years. On his 50th wedding anniversary, his wife says, Honey, how come you don't tell me you love me anymore? He said, hey, I told you I loved you and I married you. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> I mean, how many of us, that's kind of how we hire people, you know? That's our way of saying we love them when we fire them. It's, it's our way of saying it's over. In between, very little feedback. I hope maybe one of the things you'll do in the halls and over the drinks and the meals here at ICAST is you will make it a point to appreciate and thank the people who support you. And I hope that you do that after ICAS ends and you go back to your respective residences and your respective businesses. By the way, you can't over-recognize people. If you want to know, because I know there's people in the room that are left-brain analytical, analyticals like me. By the way, my formal education, as you'd all expect, is in agricultural economics. You go, oh, there he goes, bragging about being an ag economist. No, I really do have a degree in econ. If you don't have a good definition for an economist, an economist is somebody who really, really loves numbers but just didn't have the personality to become an accountant. People think it's funny unless they're an accountant. My own definition is simply an economist is an accountant who drinks. Because that's unique to me. I believe anything tequila doesn't kill deserves to live. But if you want to know, here's the ratio. If positive to negative feedback exceeds a ratio of 13 to 1 in the workplace, you're overdoing it. So here's my challenge for you today, ladies and gentlemen be the first person in the history of the world to overdo it. I've never had anybody come up to me and say, you know what I hate about working here? 
You can't do anything without somebody slapping you on the back and saying thank you. It's making me crazy. But so help me, I've had managers come up and fold their arms and say, you know, we don't give out praise easily here. We want people to earn it. And they think that that's bragging rights. You know what the greatest motivator is in 2009? I'll summarize psychology. I took psychology in college. I'm not a shrink, but I think I can summarize it more concisely than most shrinks. There are two primary human needs. If you meet those two primary human needs, that person will become your friend, your colleague, your wingman. Number one is to be noticed. Number two is to be known. Try talking to a homeless person sometime. You know why homeless people don't like to talk to you? Because nobody notices them and they become to think they're invisible. And when you engage them, it reminds them they're still there. And the beginning point of relationship is to notice the people on your team with new eyes instead of taking them for granted. That's why marriages fail, relationships and friendships end, and partnerships end. Recognize the Fred you got on your team. What is the Fred factor? See if this doesn't apply to the air show industry. It is the ability to create new value for your customers and your colleagues through passion, through commitment, and through creativity. Mark Sanborn is a best-selling author of The Fred Factor, how passion in your work and life can turn the ordinary into the extraordinary. You don't need a title to be a leader, a book about how anyone, anywhere can lead, whether or not they have a title. The Encore Effect, how to ramp up your performance in anything you do. This program is especially powerful for sales professionals. And his latest book, Up, Down, or Sideways, How to Succeed When Times Are Good, Bad, or In Between. Ambition benefits the individual, leadership benefits the greater good. And in our culture today, we're confusing kids. Because today, kids don't know the difference between fame and greatness. Fame is based on what you get. Lady Gaga is famous. Greatness is based on what you give. And the great people of history often go unnoticed, unappreciated. They don't get the attention that the celebrities get. And so we're holding up role models where children think today they should have that 15 minutes of fame. The rant, the tirade, the unusual outrageous behavior, that's what it's about instead of being of greater service to others. And so Denzel says to Tom, you know what, I've changed my mind. I'm going to retract the offer. And he goes back to the drawing board and there's a woman on his team and her name is Gail and he, he goes to Gail. The problem is Gail's a contract employee. He couldn't make her a director if he wanted to, so he's learned a little bit. He goes to Gail. He said, hey, I'd like you to, read, I'd like you to lead this project, uh, but I've got to tell you, even if you say yes, I can't make you a director. I couldn't make you a director if I wanted to. You're a contract employee. And Gail smiled and said, oh, that's okay. I don't need a title to be a leader. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how the book began. Because what Denzel shared with me crystallized something I'd always known. And that is that having a title doesn't make you a leader. In a good organization, titles should confirm leadership, but they never bestow it. And I think a lot of people think that once they get the title, they'll be leaders. No, they should be leaders before they get the title. If you've lived very long and you've worked very many places, you've probably worked for a leader who really couldn't lead. They had the title or the position, but not the skill set. And I think most people today in the world know that just because you have a title doesn't make you a leader. But you know what I think most people don't know? To me, the important point isn't that having a title doesn't make you a leader. It's that not having a title should never keep you from leading. That everybody at every level has an opportunity to lead. This conference is about servant leadership. It's about being a world changer. I got news for you. Everybody's a world changer. The only question is, what kind of change are they making? Do you consider your life a work of nonfiction on the bookshelves of history? I mean, it's about the story, isn't it? From the time we're born, children don't say, Mommy, tell me a statistic. <laughs> they don't clamor for Daddy to tell them a fact. They want to know the story. And whether it's the failed Times Square's bomber or it's the meltdown on Wall Street yesterday, we all want to know, don't we, what's the story? I mean, at this event, you've heard speakers talk about how to be the one, and they've all used the same medium. What's the medium? 
the story. I mean, Jim Collins, you know, he writes storybooks for big people. Yeah, I mean, they're true stories, uh, they're best-selling stories, but they're storybooks. Stories of how companies go from good to great. Uh, stories of how great companies fall. Last night I had a chance to meet Ben Carson, which was a real treat, because just recently my wife Darla and I watched the movie of his life with our sons, because we knew his was an inspirational story. And when I interviewed Tony Dungy, I knew going in about his professional success, but what I wanted to learn about was his personal story. Because if you understand someone's personal story, that will give you insights into their professional success. What's your story today? If somebody were to ask you what your story was, would you say it's a drama, tragedy, comedic, inspirational, or more likely, would you agree with me that most of our lives are a mix of all of those things? That we all have different stories, different days, but that ultimately our lives are permeated by story. Do you remember the movie in 2006, Stranger Than Fiction? Will Ferrell starred in a movie about a man who was living a very boring life as an IRS agent. His name was Harold Crick. And Crick was a passive actor in his own life. Until he noticed odd things beginning to happen, and it was because an author was scripting his life, and whatever she wrote happened to him, and he found it odd. But what really got his attention was when he realized the story was about to end with his death. And he looked for the author. He no longer wanted to be a bit player in his own life. He wanted to be an active participant. And isn't that really the challenge of leadership? To be actively involved in the stories we create for ourselves and for other people. And I was on a program last year, eight different events actually, for Chick-fil-A. We spoke to their managers and one of the people that I shared the platform was, was Bruce Tolgan. And I'll never forget something Bruce Tolgan said because it really began to get me thinking about the power of story and leadership. Tolgan said to the Chick-fil-A managers, he said, when a new employee starts work for you, the only thing they care about is how does working for you affect their story? That's what leadership is about. I used to say to leaders, I can assess your leadership ability by interviewing your employees with the guarantee of anonymity. And I would ask them a simple question, are you a better person because of him or her? And I, I've come to realize the question I'm really asking, is your story better because they manage you? Is your story better because they lead you? See, we live in the age where I think we're tired of hype and hyperbole and happy talk. We've come to realize that it's not enough to tell a good story. For years we used to say, you know, leaders tell a better story. And certainly there's some power in being able to tell an engaging, memorable story to get your point across clearly. But I want to stretch your thinking today and I want to suggest that leaders don't just tell a better story. They make the story better. I want to suggest this morning that we are in the same business. Now we don't do the same thing. Trust me, I can't fly aerobatics. I can't promote air shows, I've never done that, I'm not a vendor to the industry. But we are in the same business. We are about engaging, entertaining, and educating audiences. And folks, there's different ways to do it, but it's tough to do. Do you know the only thing the average person in the world today has less of than disposable income? Disposable time. And the only thing they have less of than disposable time, and this is the tough one if you're a promoter or a performer, the only thing the average person has less of than disposable time is attention. We live in the age of distraction. You can be proud that you had some 10 million to 12 million visitors to air shows in the past year, but how many more might you have had if they hadn't been bombarded with information on the internet and in newspapers and on TV and radios and they never got the message that there was an air show in their community? You got to capture the attention of the audience to get them to the air show. Then you got to capture their attention once they get there because you know what they've got? They've got their PDAs and in between acts, they're checking to see if anything happened at home or at work that's going to draw them back. And then you're about entertaining them. Most of us in the room today grew up on MTV. Did you know that the average MTV music video for many years had 120 image changes every 60 seconds? What you do as aerobatic pilots, those of you that fly in the room, is impressive, but keep in mind that the stimulation threshold is the highest it's been in the history of the world. We are stimulation junkies, and entertainment is harder than it's ever been. And on a good day, I want to suggest that you can educate.
Fortune 1000 companies rely on Mark Sanborn to motivate even the highest leaders to achieve the next level. Mark's genius is being able to craft a message that underscores an organization's mission while remaining relevant to the economic realities. To find out how Mark can bring his energy, enthusiasm, and expertise to work for your organization, contact the provider of this video. Afterward, like so many of Mark's clients, you'll say, I'm glad we hired a pro who made us look so good.